sifting through the evidence of Kathy Reich's early professional life, there's little to suggest a career as a novelist. She avoided literature classes while in college, instead focusing on the sciences, earning graduate degrees in physical anthropology and bioarchaeology from Northwestern. Reichs was set for a life in academia until law enforcement officials asked her to consult on a serial murder case. Her experiences sparked an idea for a story that would eventually become her debut novel, Deja Dead, featuring forensic anthropologist Temperance Brennan, a character whose life bears a striking resemblance to the author's own. She won the Arthur Ellis Award for Best First Novel, which launched her protagonist into action stretching 20 novels and counting. The series was adapted into the hit Fox television series Bones, which ran for 12 seasons. Despite this success, Reichs continued to work as a forensic anthropologist, applying her skills in both North Carolina and Montreal, where she spends part of each year. Her expertise in the field has led her to serve as a consultant to the UN Tribunal on Genocide in Rwanda and to assist in identifying remains of victims of the September 11th attacks in New York City. If that weren't enough, she's also co-authored the viral series of young adult novels with her son, Brendan Reichs. And her latest novel, A Conspiracy of Bones, is irrefutable evidence that Kathy Reichs is at the top of her game. All right. We would like to welcome Kathy Reichs to the show today. Cheers. Cheers. Welcome. Cheers. Come on in there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I didn't That's... know we'd be drinking. <laughs> Bummer. Oh, I yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll drink for you. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kathy, I'm going to get right into it with you then. So the... Um, before your newest title, I wanted to ask you about the beginnings of a, as a novelist. So tell us about your path that led to your 1997 debut, Deja Dead. What a cool name. Mm -hmm. Had you always envisioned life as a writer, even while pursuing no, your PhD? No. At uh, I avoided literature classes in university. I wanted to be over dissecting frogs, uh, you know, and <laughs> biology and science classes. I was the opposite. You know, I took the obligatory intro to fiction and intro to poetry. And then, you know, that was it. I got my PhD in bioarchaeology. Um, and I planned to spend my whole career in academia um, studying the ancient dead. And uh, back in the day, and don't you ask me how far back that date was. Um, <laughs> sciences, the forensic sciences weren't as formalized. So you didn't have a procedure of board certification. Mm -hmm. So when police or whoever would find bones, they said, well, what do we, what do we do? So they said, well, take them out to that bones lady out at the university. Um, I, I wrote about this in a story called First Bones, which is an origin story for Temperance Brennan, but it's yeah. my origin story also, because that's how I got into forensics is police started bringing me cases. That's cool. And, yeah. Yeah. I was, planning to do the archaeological recovery of materials. But um, once I did forensic work um, for the medical examiner, the coroner, I just really liked um, the relevance of it. The mm. fact that you were, you know, archaeology is absolutely fascinating. I still love it. I still love a case when I get to return to my roots, in a sense. Um, because someone brings in archaeological materials, but you're not going to impact anyone's life. Whereas when you tell a family you've identified a missing member or you testify in court, you, you are yeah. going to change lives. So I really like that um, relevance and I retrained and sat for my boards and then I became a forensic scientist and I envisioned myself doing that. I'm getting to your question. Yeah. I envisioned myself doing that <laughs> in my career. And then um, 19, somewhere in the mid 90s, um, I made full professor at the university. And I had just worked on a serial murder case because I was teaching university. I was still in academia, but I was also consulting on the side to the medical examiner in North Carolina and to the Laboratoire de Sciences Judiciaires de Médecine Légale in Montreal. And that's another whole story how that started. So I was doing half forensics, half uh, in academia. And I made full professor, and I had worked on a serial murder case. So I was free to do whatever I wanted after, you know, that's the highest 
rank you can attain. It's the last carrot they can dangle in front of you. Um, and I had a story idea. So I had the freedom to try something new, fiction, and a story idea. So that's how I came to uh, write uh, Deja Dead. Did you just uh -huh. go right into writing it or did you do any sort of like writing research as far as the how-to aspects or did it just come natural? I did do some research. Um, I, I wrote a partial manuscript and um, maybe I was a hundred pages or more into it and I read it and I thought this is so boring <laughs> and I put it, it was Temperance Brennan, um, it was third person voiced I put it away hmm. and I didn't look at it for quite a while. And then I decided, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to finish it. And so I got it back out. I looked at it and I said, nope. The only thing I kept was the Temperance Brennan character, the idea of a strong female character, a forensic anthropologist, a mur thriller, a murder mystery, but science driven, the solution. And I switched to first person voice. And that just really worked for me. And then I just wrote the whole thing. It took me two years because I was yeah. still teaching and doing my consulting. Right, right, right. <laughs> regular work. I had kids, you know, uh, so, but it took two years. And uh, yeah, so. And then, and now you have uh, Conspiracy of Bones. And right. to the delight of your friends, it's the 19th Temperance Reynolds. Wow. Really yeah. amazing. 19th. That's uh it's pretty it's an amazing accomplishment. Yeah, Congratulations. Thank you. Uh can you share a little bit about the horrors that Temperance is going to encounter in this one? Can you just give us a little glimpse? Oh boy, she's got a lot on her plate in this yeah. one. <laughs> she's got she's a recovering. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's got some health issues. Mm -hmm. she's recovering from surgery for an unerupted cerebral aneurysm. Um, which is an Big deal. It's fairly routine. Uh, uh, so an aneurysm is just a little bubble. Depends mm -hmm. on where it's at. <laughs> off, off one artery. So they go in and they put these little coils in there. Platinum, Pl I think. Platinum coils, coils yep. Yeah. Lock it off. Um, but she's having some post-surgical reactions to medications and things. She's having migraine headaches, maybe some hallucinations, mm -hmm. dreams. I don't know what you want to call them. So for the first time in her life, she can't totally rely on her own perceptions. And for her, that's, that's a first. That's something new. The other problem she's having is that in that short story, that I just referenced, First Bones, we learned that her longtime forever boss in Charlotte, Tim Larrabee, the medical examiner, has been murdered. So in this book, which takes place shortly after that uh, happened, there's a new boss in town, yeah. a woman named Margot Hebner. And Tempe and Hebner have history together. This woman can't stand her. She has vowed that Tempe will never set foot in the medical examiner office again. So in this, and we can go into what the story is, what she's investigating, she's having to go rogue. She's having to do it on the outside, do right. it on her own and rely on her own resources, her own colleagues, her own network. So the beginning of Conspiracy of Bones is not for the squeamish. Um, Temperance receives four images of a mutilated corpse uh, and looks as if it's been chewed by animals. <laughs> Use some powerful imagery in each book, and it gives readers a really a visceral experience when they're reading your books. But after so many books, is it a challenge to summon those scenes, or have you just seen so much in your career that the well never runs dry? <laughs> I don't think the well ever runs dry. Part of it comes from my career. <laughs> Part of it were, comes from being a producer on Bones. And we did 246 episodes, each one of which opens with uh, compromised human remains. <laughs> it would be funny when we'd be sitting in the writer's room and you do what's called breaking the story and all the writers are in there together and you're throwing out ideas and brainstorming. And for the opening scene, after 200 and whatever, episodes you so okay well what about if the body is found squashed behind the high school bleachers <laughs> in the gym oh no we did that in season two what, what about if it's found in a vat of red wine and no we need that <laughs> you killed so many people <laughs> a lot of people and they were discovered in many bizarre yeah wow. so yeah so i guess you'd you know, I don't know what goes on in my head, but you know, after a while you get pretty good at dreaming those things up. 
or drawing on real cases. In the case of a conspiracy of bones, um, I drew on an actual case. Oh, um, it was wow. a, a journalist uh, in Ottawa, Ontario, went missing. Her mm -hmm. body was found several months later out in a very heavily wooded remote area called the Gatineau. And she'd been scavenged uh, by bears. Oh, bears, not pigs, bears. Yeah, but not, not pigs. Hmm. But when I moved the story to, so I worked on that case. I helped in recovery of her remains and then in analyzing her remains also. So when I switched the story to North Carolina, I didn't want to use bears. We've got them up in the mountains, but this story's not set in the mountains. So we, we do have feral hogs. <laughs> so, yeah, no kidding. But, Okay, and that evolved. At first it was gonna be next to a hog farm and somehow the hogs got through the fence or something. And then I said, no, let's just go full hog. They're <laughs> 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 all hogs, so. Some people would say that's, that's demented. That's a t-shirt, let's just go full hog. <laughs> it's, it's a dark place in here. <laughs> well, you're on the right show then. Yes. <laughs> Uh, you just alluded to it. Uh, you were, uh, and you are uh, 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 on the show Bones as a producer. Uh, and we've talked with a number of uh, authors on our show uh, who have bridged the gap between uh, publishing and then Hollywood. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of folks have some similar experiences. And we wanted to get your take on uh, what your personal experience has been uh, floating in the world between the 180 degree you know worlds of publishing and and hollywood i could not i'm not one of these authors who's going to whine about they took my art and they destroyed it i could <laughs> not have had a better experience i oh, love awesome. this our executive producers hart hansen and barry josephson were just fantastic i had had several offers before um i decided to go with them as the executive to option my character mm -hmm. um Nothing seemed quite the right combination, but when I met with Hart and Barry, I just, the vibe was, was right. I liked what they wanted to do with the character. I liked what they wanted to do with the show. The idea there would, the primary storyline each week would be a murder and it would be solved through a team, the teamwork of, you know, forensic scientists and that there would be humor in the show. Yeah, exactly. Um, I've always put humor in the books and boy, that's tough. Yeah. Dealing with violent death in every episode <laughs> or in every book. How do you put humor in without being offensive? You know, it's a real delicate. Um, well, it yeah. helps you have, you had good actors too. We have wonderful show. actors. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not good. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, no, I couldn't. And Emily Deschanel is the nicest person on the planet. She's a much nicer person than I am. <laughs> Very kind and gentle and generous, and the entire staff and crew and writers, everyone loved Emily. That's good to hear that you had such a positive experience because you know you hear the other side with some frequency. And so um, yeah. that's got to make you feel good about your character from taken care of quite well. Mm -hmm. So, And then I love being able to write. Um, when uh, Hart, our showrunner, said to me, why don't you write an episode? And I said, well, Hart, I don't, I don't know how to write it. A teleplay, a screenplay. Yeah. And he said, well, you didn't know how to write a novel either. And that turned out pretty well. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that is an awesome support from yeah. the producer yeah. because as I've, we've talked about with some other writers is a lot of times in Hollywood, or TV or film, they don't want to see the writer. <laughs> Give us your story and get out of our way. So when I first went out to film the pilot, um, they were, I could tell they were, they had, they were wary of me. <laughs> and um, my view was they know a whole lot more about television production than I do. And I'm just going to, you know, I had like three, throughout the whole 12 years, I had three goals. I don't want to have my cell phone ever go off while we're live filming. <laughs> I don't want to trip over anything on set. And I don't want to knock anything over. Those are my goals. <laughs> so, but when simple, turn, simple. <laughs> stay back um, and comment on the science because that's really, yeah. that's really yeah. what I wanted, 
my input. And when we were filming the pilot, they were so proud, our, our, our special effects people and the producers, um, they showed it was the lady in the lake. And it was a, a lady that was an intern who'd gone missing mm -hmm. and found in the bottom of a lake in Washington, DC. That might sound familiar. Yeah. <laughs> and she'd been down there two years. So they had these glistening bubbles of intestines. Nice. And I looked at that and I said, Two years? Two years underwater? Yeah, no, we got it. Maybe know. a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, they probably thought, oh boy, she is going to be such a pain in the ass. But. Yeah. Well, you saved the episode too, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sticking with the television aspect, um, you'd written several temperance printed novels before Bones became a television show. Did the portrayal of the character on the television show change your approach to writing her in any way? Did it augment it, change it? No, it, uh, no. And I think of TV Tempe and Book Tempe, and they're different. Mm -hmm. I mean, TV Tempe mm -hmm. is, Book Tempe is older. Um, she's more polished. She's more sophisticated uh, socially. Her social graces are somewhat better. She's in Montreal and the Carolinas, whereas TV Tempe's younger. She's, you know, she's very awkward socially. Um, mm -hmm. She's in Washington, D.C. at the Jeffersonian, which is a funny story how it came to be the Jeffersonian. Hmm. Um, so when I sit down to write a Temperance Brennan book, I don't have to worry about TV Tempe. And initially there was a little bit of wait, wait a minute, this is different. This isn't the same as in the books. And I would say to people, well, think of it as a prequel. Think of it Tempe, the early years, you know, ah. younger. And people seem to go along with that. And then as they grew to love the show and they watched that character evolve, what Emily did with that character over 12 years was, was brilliant. Um, there, I did, there was no more of that. You just mentioned that, uh, the Jeffersonian. Yeah. Um, where is that? Because I live, I, you know, I work in Washington, D.C. I, I live, you know, in the area. I, I haven't driven by that place. Yeah, no, it's right down on, on, on uh, the, in the uh, tidal basin there. <laughs> right. <laughs> so the, what's uh, the story behind that? What's the story? Well, it came down to where we had, to, we were, you know, it's obviously it's the Smithsonian. Right. It came down to where we had to put the logos on the truck and on the, the lab coats and everything. And the lawyers at the Smithsonian weren't saying, yes, you can call it the Smithsonian, but they weren't saying, no, you can't call it the Smithsonian. <laughs> but we just decided, the, the producers decided, uh, yeah, you know what, we'll just call it the Jeffersonian. <laughs> totally make a new one. That's actually got a really good ring to it, though, and I, yeah. I like it. Um, Kathy, why do you think readers are fascinated by the stories uh, of, of work conducted by medical examiners and, in your case, forensic anthropologists? Why do you think they're drawn to those? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, somewhere in the mid-90s, and this is kind of why I, I decided to write fiction, a, a novel, forensic science was in the air. All the, for years, no one paid any attention. No one heard of us. They didn't. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew what forensic anthropology was or forensic toxicology. And then suddenly we became hot. We became popular and sexy. And um, I, I, to me, and I could have my timing off, maybe it's about the time we were exposed 24-7 to the O.J. Simpson trial and people were hearing about mm, what's Yeah, I remember that. And, and DNA and yeah. trajectory of wounds and, you know... <sighs> I don't know, but all of a sudden, it's, it's, it seems to me it started in the mid-90s, and um, I just caught that wave, or maybe contributed to the wave, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I bet. It's, it's one of those things where, you know, they, they say don't write to the market, you know, just write what you love and write what you're, you're right. thinking about, and, and the timing just happened. It was kind of perfect, but, but I, I want to, I you know, maybe dial down a little bit, and, and why do you think, as a, like, as a species, we're drawn to the macabre? Do you have any thoughts to that? Well, I think people people are intrigued by evil, and I think the ultimate evil, the ultimate thing you can take from someone else is their life. Yeah. Right? yeah. And people also like to see closure. You know, it's a cliche, but good winning out over evil. Sure. Um, the bad guy or girl getting caught. I think people also with thrillers and mysteries they like to solve the puzzle. 
they like as they're reading. I know as a reader, this is what I do. I like to try to figure it out before the author tells me. Heck yeah. Read through the clues, which ones are real clues and which ones are red herring clues. And it's fair to put red herring clues in as long as they make sense and as long as you tie them off. Yeah. Um, and I'm disappointed in an author if I figure it out. <laughs> Her job is to keep me guessing and have me guess wrong and then throw that twist in. Yeah. So I think that's part of it too, is people like to solve the puzzle. And I think also in forensic, scientifically driven books, like mine, they like to learn a little something along. I mean, the bottom line is a good story. They sure. want a good story. But I think they like, my readers like to learn something along the way as well. Yeah. And two, um, and I'm going to throw this out there as a, as a, as a follow up to follow up. How do you, and I kind of run into this myself writing my own thing is how do you, how do you temper, um, assuming the audience knows more than they should know, you know, in your background, um, how do you, I'm going to say dumb it down to an average person's uh, conversation level versus, I mean, what you think is common knowledge is, is way beyond anyone else's expectations on what they should know. So how do you, how do you temper that? Yeah. And they don't want to read a textbook. Yeah, exactly. When I learn a little something. Um, you have to keep it brief, the science, you have to keep it entertaining Mm -hmm. which is not a prerequisite for a textbook. And you have to keep it jargon free. You can't use any of that special terminology that we as scientists use amongst each other because right. you'll lose your audience. It's the same skill set, I think, as talking to a jury. You want to keep their attention. Right. You mm -hmm. want them to understand it, but you don't want to dumb it down necessarily. Right. Yeah, I've had to I've had to do that a couple of times and gotten yelled at by DAs and stuff. So um, I want to take this in a little bit different direction now. Um, in addition to your Brennan series, you co-authored a whole series with your son, Brendan. I did. How satisfying was that as a parent to watch him work and grow as a writer uh, beyond something than which his education level was a legal brief? How, how was that for you as a mom? It, well, it was interesting, not just as a mom, but because he's also a lawyer. He's a litigator. Right. So, um, and he hated being a lawyer. Yes. Yeah. So mm. He practiced law for like two years. <laughs> wow. And, <laughs> he, and then he was desperate to do anything else. So he said, why don't we write a young adult series? And partly that was because uh, pe parents would come to me either email me or come to me at my events or my signings and say, is it okay if my daughter reads your Temperance Brennan books? And I'd say, well, how old is she? And they'd say seven. And I'd go, no. Uh, no. <laughs> what? what? Like sleeping in your bed. <laughs> you were a bad parent. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we just, but kids are interested in, in mysteries. And sure. we thought it would be, and in forensics, as it turns out. So we, you know, we thought, so we came up with this idea to have Temperance Brennan's 14-year-old great niece, Tori Brennan, and her three best friends who are boys, um, that they would use science at kind of a middle school, high school level and yeah. solve cold cases and mysteries and, you know, puzzles and things. So that's what we did. We did six books together. Um, he was better at some things. Um, he's younger than I am such as um, ki how kids talk and right. the social concerns of, of uh, teens. Whereas I was better with the science and that sort of thing. So he'd do his sections, I'd do my sections. Um, then I would print it out and I would literally with a red pen, I would make editorial comments. And then um, we would have our um, editorial meetings where we would discuss our <laughs> Artistic differences. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> who, who won? Who would win those? Does mom win those? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I would point I in my office. I'm not at my house in Charlotte, but in my office there, I have all the covers of all my books framed. And so, <laughs> so I would just kind of point to the 16 books. And, <laughs> Love it. Yeah, but, you know, and then he dumped me. He, oh, <laughs> oh, my gosh. He, dumped, he signed a contract. He did his first series. It's called Nemesis. Mm -hmm. There's three books in that. Nemesis, Genesis, Crystallis. And now he's doing a middle grade. That's, excuse, 
a little older, young adult. And now he's doing, um, with Ali Condi, he's doing a middle grade series called The Dark Deep. And he's also just signed two different contracts that I'm not at liberty to talk about. Wow, impressive. Wow. characters. So. Wow. That is awesome. Sounds yeah. like he might, he might have learned a little something from me along the way, whether he said it or not. He, well, he also got very serious. He went back to school. He got a master's of fine art in writing fiction. So wow. he's much better informed than I am. <laughs> so cool. So Temperance is an extremely strong female character. Her niece is obviously a strong female character. You came up in an industry, I don't know if it was, was it dominated by men when you started into the area you are? You know, it's funny. I don't think I'd say that as far, as far as writing crime fiction. I think the ladies have always been, if you think back. To I'm sorry, I'm talking about the, the yeah. forensic, uh, forensic mythology. Oh, forensics. Yeah. For, yeah, yeah, still is. Um, forensic anthropology isn't quite as bad as, say, forensic chemistry or forensic uh, engineering. Um, those are really, I remember one time I belonged to the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. Most, most mm -hmm. of us do. And there are different sections in there. And I remember one time a journalist asked me uh, this question and we got it, got out the, the um, uh, membership directory. And we looked at how many board certified forensic dentists there were. And of 99 members of that section, one, there was one Good female. Lord. Jeez. Whereas anthropology ran something like three to one, men to women, so 30%. So we were all, I think because we're academically based, we weren't quite as skewed as some of the other disciplines, um, but it's getting a lot better yeah. um, than, than right. it was back in that day. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, it, it, I would hope it had evened out. Um, with you know, staying with that topic, the, the two times I was present for an autopsy, I um, someone wisely told me like, "Hey, take some Vicks and rub it under your nose, and you'll be good. You're good." Yeah. The uh, you know, I don't know how many you've been around, but you've been around death. Um, you know, however long that death had happened, but do you ever get used to that smell? Uh, you do. Yeah, you do. I, yeah. I don't use Vicks. I don't you know burn <laughs> coffee grounds or anything. I do have pictures uh, that have appeared in. I, I forget what paper, but I'm down there digging this body out of a shallow grave, and behind me are these big burly detectives, and they've got. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, it makes a difference if the if the bowel is perforated. That's that's when things get exciting. I uh, know. Exciting. I know. I, the people I work on are usually a little bit further along. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those one or two dayers that can get nasty. Yeah. We've kind of touched about touched on your science background, you, but your books deal with a lot of science that's peripheral to what you studied, whether it's blood splatter, criminology, ballistics. Right. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that research process? Is it mostly interview based? Is it experiential or is it internet? Or is it kind of a combination of all? It's a combination of all of those. Um, I'm fortunate because the lab I work at in Montreal is a combined crime and medical legal lab. Mm. So everybody's there. We've got the hair and fiber guys, and we've got the DNA section. We've got the fire and arson section, the bomb people. You know, everybody is right. is there. Yeah. So I can just walk down the corridor um, and ask one of my colleagues, usually. Not always. Um, in one book, um, I did just do a cold hit kind of send an email. I, had, I needed a forensic linguist, and uh, we do not have a forensic linguist. I've uh -huh. never and didn't know one. So I, I, I Googled it, of course. What do you do? You Google it. And this one name kept coming up, Rob Leonard at Hofstra University. So I just sent him an email. And sure enough, he replied and he said he'd be happy to help me. And this was for uh, Bones to Ashes. We, had, we were writing, doing an analysis of some poetry, kind of like what was done with the, the Unabomber when he wrote right. that manifesto. And we were well into it when someone said to me, wait, are you talking about the Rob Leonard? And I said, what are you talking about? Turned out he was one of the, he's a PhD linguist at Hofstra University. Turns out he was one of the founding members of Sha Na Na. <laughs> what? Wait, yes. what's his name? What? Wait a minute, yeah. What? Rob Leonard. So I went out on the internet and I found a, a 
a clip of Shauna and I playing at Woodstock. And I sent it to him and I said, Rob, is that you in the leather pants? And he wrote back almost immediately and said they were gold lame. <laughs> and then another one, I loved those pants. <laughs> Anyway, so that was, you know, he just out of the blue helped me. I had no idea. He he told me, he said at age 50, he would rather be, you know, an academic linguist than be a dead rock star, aging rock star. Right, so right. But back to school, got his doctorate. And oh, I left, I left, I left a touring band of 12 years. I didn't want to be a starving artist anymore either. I remember that. I would, I would forever call him Dr. Bowser just because that's the only Sean and Nah person that I remember from my childhood. <laughs> How crazy is that? It's so funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as a forensic anthropologist, you spent uh, time in multiple locations throughout the world identifying remains from different eras. Uh, was the recovery phase from 9-11 different for you from all the other operations that you were involved in? Oh, that was a tough one. Yeah, mm, that may yeah. be the toughest thing I've ever done um, because we worked 13-hour shifts. We had to wear this big gear we looked yeah. like uh, astronauts or astronauts yeah. right uh, with you know with the breathing apparatus. respirators I was, were, you, were you in staten island i was yeah, yeah. fresh kills fresh kills mm -hmm. is the name of which is dutch for fresh streams but yeah we just spent all day going through debris going through rubble there were these big conveyor belts and they would shake the stuff and it would separate it right and we would go through debris and just um try to recover a bone remain yeah. everything was so fragmentary there was no identification going on it was really done later by dna so um we would determine if it was human because there were a lot of animal uh bones there there were restaurants and you know right or whatever so we had to determine what was human and then each day the me van would come we would bag it and give it a number and, and tag it then they would come and collect it each day sure I, w I wear a bracelet on my uh, on yeah. my arm for uh, John Delara. He's an NYPD police officer. It's been on my it's been on my wrist since nine eleven. They never found anything yeah. that could identify his body. Yeah, yeah. Other than that, what's the most unique or memorable case that you were involved in that you can share with us? Because we're kind of like having a little fun with that idea. Oh, there's so many. Uh, the Deja Dead, my first book I mentioned was a serial based on a serial murder case. Wow. Um, and in that case, what came to be, uh, I worked on one of the victims, the first victim, which a woman who was murdered and dismembered and then buried in five different locations. So it wasn't really a question when he was arrested. I didn't know who he was, of course, but he was arrested and uh, he admitted to killing her and burying her in these five locations. So mm. what I was specifically, what I testified about were the cut marks in the bone. Could I determine um, what kind of tool was used in the dismemberment? Huh. which I could not because it was a straight edged uh, knife that yeah. was not serrated or there were no teeth in it. So it left almost no information. But what was telltale, telltale was the way he went about it. And he went about it in a very skilled, almost like an orthopedic surgeon or a, a no kidding. So I, I told police that it could have been an orthopedic surgeon or a butcher or something. And it turned out this clown had been a butcher for many, many wow. years. Wow. <sighs> yeah, amazing. that was interesting. One little piece of the puzzle. That and and na narrow, narrows it down just a little bit more and you're able to, the investigators are able to go out and, and use yeah. that information. That's crazy. That's fascinating, actually. It is so cool. I mean, to be able to, be able to determine that that was kind of something. Yeah. Uh, pretty cool. Um, so I, you know, I did not know that your, you know, your first draft of, uh, of your first novel was in third person. That's kind of, it's a very interesting little fact. Um, but what draws you to the, to the uh, first person point of view is, is it therapeutic in, in some way of processing all of your experiences? Well, it's more like, it's just, I'm telling my own story hmm. coming from, you know, it's limiting. If you use first person voice, you're limited only to what your character sees. Right. Right smells or feels um but to me that just that just works to to have it coming out of her mouth and she's telling her story is like i'm telling my story hmm. 
It's compelling. Yeah. I mean, you have 19, 19 of them now. <laughs> I guess it's worked so far. No, we're down 20. So. <laughs> well, that's actually what I was going to ask next. So how far ahead do you, do you think of the next novel is when you finish the first one? Or do you have like a list of, you know, seven, eight, 10, 20 stories that you're like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell these eventually. I, I do. Uh, I'm working on 20 now and I'm already thinking, I, I already have an idea for 21. Nice. Uh, well, that's awesome. <laughs> but music to your fans. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, I mean, that's obviously, obviously it's a successful series, but when you have a character that, that you have no problem coming up with 2021, that tells you that <laughs> you got the right damn character. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty amazing. <laughs> what is a nice girl from Chicago huh? doing in Canada? Did you not have enough of the winters? Oh my God! Yeah. Well, I did. <laughs> I moved from Chicago to to North Carolina, and yep. I've lived most of my life, my all of my adult life, in North Carolina. Uh, that's, a, okay. that's a good move. That's, yeah, a good that's move. smart. <laughs> the reason I left Chicago was because of the weather. I said mm. I will never go one snowstorm too many. I Same am, here. Well, then I'd been in the Carolinas. I don't know how many years. Um, when at a faculty meeting, an offer for something called National Faculty Exchange, NFE, mm. came across our desks. And uh, I had just that year decided that um, any educated person should speak French. So instead of <laughs> taking my lunch hour, I would go and I sat in on a French 101 class. <laughs> Je m'appelle cool. Kathy. It was very humbling. <laughs> <laughs> So then this, this NFE thing came across our desks and there was a professor at a university in Montreal that wanted to come to Charlotte, to my home institution. So, oh. and he, so had to learn, he had to learn Carolina. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> well, he was an Anglophone, so yeah. Uh, okay. So, yeah, so I thought, yeah, may we? <laughs> mm. <laughs> French. <laughs> so I applied and they accepted me and off I went. So that I taught it um, the two... English language universities, Concordia and McGill, that year. And that's when I started working at the medical legal lab there. They needed a, a board certified forensic anthropologist and someone that could work in French. So I think there was a pool of one. <laughs> <laughs> that's job security. <laughs> Do you, do you when you cross when you cross over to you know the international line there? Do you have to get recertified, or they go, you know what, America's board, it's good enough. You're good to work here. Oh uh, no, <laughs> the Canadians do not have their own board. Oh, they don't. Okay. Board of Forensic Anthropology (ABFA) is America in the sense of North America. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Canada, the U.S. Okay. Well. You have survived the main portion of our interview. Well done. So well well done. done. Congratulations. <laughs> Flying colors. <laughs> we are now going into what we call the lightning round. And this is a series of questions from all three of us. There's very little thought put into the questions. We expect very little thought in your answers. I'm good at that. <laughs> <laughs> so are we. I doubt we'll figure. It. <laughs> yeah. And as the host, I'm going to ask my first few questions. Let's start with the age old question. What's the best pizza in Chicago? Mm. Oh, you know, I used to like Gino's. Gino's East. Gino's East. That's there you pepperoni. Go. Yes. Yeah, it's a thick crust, but it's really gooey cheesy. I don't even yeah. know if it's still there. It's still there. It's yep. still there. I was just back about two months ago. May it never die. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever we'd go to Chicago, we would always have pizza, of course, and we would always have um, Italian beef sandwiches. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't go to Portillo's, though, did you? I think, well, we were in the Western suburbs. We used to stay with relatives. So I think it was called Carms or something. Okay. Hmm. I lived in Naperville, so I'm not sure if I remember that name. My son went to uh, we, his first Cub game. He saw the Italian beef sandwich and Italian sausage sandwich combined. And he was just like, you would have thought it was the Holy Grail. He was, yeah, you know, dude, that's heaven. You know, boys that's with heaven. their iron stomachs. He was just like. <laughs> heaven. <laughs> All right. Question number two. What is your favorite bone in the human body? Humorous. <laughs> <laughs> That's mine. <laughs> Actually, no, it's fibula a fibula. It's connected to the fibula. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> not really. All right. Question number three. This is a riddle. 
How long does it take for a team of anthropologists to screw in a light bulb? <laughs> what is that like? One to hold the light bulb and two to move the, the ladder? <laughs> so the real answer is 20 seconds plus three years to complete your field notes on the event and 10 years to publish. Okay, gotcha. That's not nice. <laughs> that makes sense though. He's holding well, it in. <laughs> only, a, only a doctor would come up with that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm off. Who's up next? Johnny. I am. What mysterious death or criminal cold case throughout history would temperance most want to work? Mm. Oh, gosh. Um, Lizzie Borden? I mean, she really Ooh. got bad press. <laughs> and I'm, not sure, I'm not sure it was all deserved. So that might have, it would have to be something that would have left a mark in the bones, I think. Unless I was able to be there right when it happened, but... Mm. Then they wouldn't need an anthropologist. True. <laughs> yeah. I think an axe usually leaves a pretty good mark, I imagine. Pretty good mark. Yeah. All right. Now, this is a TV question. Very detailed TV question. Did you have any interaction with Dr. Sweets while producing the TV show Bones? Uh, well, I... Interaction? Do Dr. <laughs> Sweets the squirrel? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Sweets. Um, we would sit when he was in an episode and between shoots, we would sit around and chat and eat and, you know, talk and socialize. That's about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read, I read a piece of trivia that, that there was a squirrel that would um, hang out on set for most of the, I don't know how many of the 12 years it was um, who would like come up and, Really? Just hang on your leg. It, I don't know if that was true. It was an internet, internet rumor about a, a squirrel on the set of bones. So I wasn't sure if that was a... And, and they called it Dr. Sweets? They called it Dr. Sweets, I guess, because it would come get candy or something initially. I don't know. But one of those internet things I thought that would... <laughs> I'm going to go back and ask Hart Hansen about that because I didn't I met the squirrel. Oh, I might have missed it. Okay, oh, that would have been a cool story, though. Yeah. This, is a little bit of a, this is a little bit of an inside baseball for the crew reviews, but um, I will explain at the end of the show. Since mm. I know you're not a native, but as a part-time resident, who is the greatest Canadian rock band or artist? Bare Naked Ladies. All right. Oh, yeah, you guys, that's an a answer. good answer. That's a pretty good I, answer. You know, uh, everyone else would say Celine Dion, but... Right. We, well, we, we've gotten a few different answers. Uh, well, we've, we, we've had Canadians answers. actually say, well, I don't know any Canadian rock bands. Well, we had a Canadian say... Eight, eight, like, well, maybe. yeah, we had one Canadian. <laughs> Simon Gervais. <laughs> you know who your name is. <laughs> hey, Kathy, if you weren't a forensic anthropologist or a writer, what would you be? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, what would I have chosen to be when I was young enough to still yeah. do it? <laughs> right. I don't know. Maybe a professional tennis player. I, I was never good enough. <laughs> <laughs> was, it, was it always, this is what I'm going to be? Or you kind of, did you fall into that profession? Or I did fall into it. Um, did. I hmm. wasn't sure what I, and as an under, I, I think I had three or four undergraduate majors. But once I took a physical anthropology class, then I was really intrigued. And that was back in those days when you didn't worry about getting a job. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have one lined up when you were a sophomore already, like, you know, coming out. I did not. And, for, and you know, went to grad school mainly to avoid having to, to deal with the question of getting a job. So. Did, uh, <laughs> if you don't mind me asking, what were, what were your parents' uh, reactions when you told them that's what you wanted to do? <clears throat> they were good with it. Um, oh, okay. That's awesome. They were good with it. They were, they were, my dad was saying, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Did we have the same dad? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, my mom was always fascinated with stuff like that. So. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I, I think we all are. Um, what was the silliest thing or most outlandish thing that you saw on the set of Bones? It's got to be a story. I don't know. I remember one episode when we were doing something with turkeys and they were shooting frozen turkeys from about the ups, the upper level down onto the forensic platform. It was one of TJ's, one of Hodgins' experiments. That was kind of wild because these turkeys were obviously not really frozen turkeys and they were bouncing in frozen food. What? <laughs> Had he not WKRP's Thanksgiving special? <laughs> Is it, did they do that? Wait a minute. Was it? What episode was that? I don't remember seeing that. Famous one where they, they let the turkeys out of the uh, 
out of the helicopter and he says, as God is my witness, I did not know turkeys couldn't fly. Like, <laughs> oh. oh my gosh, Sean, that was, that's crazy. <laughs> um, here's my last question for you. Um, is there a way to describe death in a cheerful way? You're so good at it, Gory. Well, I not really. I lost my cat about two weeks ago. <laughs> talked about him crossing the Rainbow Bridge, and I thought, oh, really? Mm. But I guess that's a pleasant metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll go with it. It's filled with paper cups and things to shove off the side as you're going across. I think it's I think it's much better to describe it the way you do. Um, I, either that, or they thought my cat was gay. I don't know. <laughs> But that's okay. <laughs> I think he was actually. Yeah. Well, that's the end of the lightning round, and you survived both portions of the show. So, wow, congratulations. fantastic. Congratulations. Kathy, thank you so here. much. Oh, thank you. That went very quickly. Yeah. Oh, awesome. For me, anyway. <laughs> well, congratulations to your 19th yeah. novel coming out. Oh, my goodness. That's amazing. Congrats. We're all Bones fans, and thank you so much for taking the time to Absolutely. be on our show. Buy Conspiracy of Bones, people. Buy all the books, but buy Conspiracy of Bones. Thank you. Cheers, Cheers. to you. The boys and I would like to thank Dr. Kathy Reichs for coming on the show today. Her latest novel, The Conspiracy of Bones, number 19, the Temperance Brennan series, is out. So go out and buy it. Mm. Do it. And join us every Monday for another best-selling guest. Boys, let's toast out to the wonderful Kathy Wright. Amen. I couldn't Cheers. do it without Appreciate this. You guys. And you guys. Great guests. Cheers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with you? You're not even recording. Yeah, he is. Yes, oh, man. you are. You are good. Three, okay. two, one. Demons be gone. All right. We want to thought. No, we don't want to thought. <laughs> what? Cheers. What is wrong with you? Uh, I tell you what's wrong is about as much as missing out of this glass is what's wrong. The boys and I would like to thank Doctor Kathy Reichs and her. Uh, <laughs> What? Come on! He froze. He froze. <laughs> Where, where'd he go? <laughs> oh, Sean's in trouble too, by the way. You can hear in the background. <laughs> Mary, shut it. It's not me. Okay. Who is it? Chris's house. She was the door. She's so pissed off. She's saying I'm going to work out. That's not right. <laughs> I can hear her through the eight foot thick walls with the. Please, please do this in one more take. <laughs> All right. Three, two, yeah. Yeah. Mm, 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 mm. Do it. And catch the other 18 thrillers in the Temperance Brennan novel series. We'd also like to thank... <laughs> Kermit? <laughs> Who else would we like to thank? <laughs> Kermit? <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, it already came out in March, so it doesn't come out in March. <laughs> come on, I'm gonna get shot. What are you doing? <laughs> She's gonna kill me. <laughs> I'm gonna have to pull out of Chris and just do a three and a half seconder because Dude. yeah, I think the bourbon's just you really I'm like. Thank you very much for coming on. Appreciate it. Three, two, yeah. The boys and I would like to thank Dr. Kathy Reichs and her latest novel coming out. Oh, why would I think a book coming out? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> There's a gun pointed at my head. <laughs> you just fucking do this. By, we, we need to do these a little earlier in the day. I can't okay, do it this late in the game. All right, three, two, yeah. I'm gonna have a drink now, wait a minute. <laughs> I with a smile on my face. Oh, man. I'm getting emails from the internet. Your time has run out. All right. <clears throat> Three, two, one. Game.